wrapping up our, our series on the Apostles' Creed today. Um, has this been a helpful series for you? Yeah. Anyone? Two people. <laughs> Two people. I hope that you've grown a little bit in the knowledge of, of what it is that we're actually saying when we say the creed. I hope it has challenged you and encouraged you in your faith. But all good things must come to an end. And what that means starting next week is we're going to be entering into our Christmas season. I can't believe we're even talking about Christmas already. And so we're just going to be talking on this idea of God with us, that, that he left his heavenly throne in heaven to be born of a baby, that he might become one of us. Like this is how great our God is, that he's not this transcendent, just transcendent or, or magnificent being in the sky that we can't touch. Although he is all of that, he is also with us. He wants to have an intimate relationship with us. He identifies with us, that we have a, a high priest that is able to sympathize with everything that we experience in life. And so we're going to be talking about that starting next week as we enter into this Christmas series. How many of you have had your Christmas tree up before Thanksgiving? I don't know if you're saved. I don't know if you're saved this morning. But one more, one more uh, sermon today as we center on, on the Apostles' Creed. We've been taking this creed line by line and, and teasing out the meaning. And so today we're going to focus on this phrase, I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life ever lasting. Here's something that we all have in common today, that you and I are going to die. Preach, <laughs> preach. How many of you don't like talking about death? We, we just kind of ignore it. We avoid it. Uh, we all like talking about death. We have a morbid group here today. <laughs> I, I know Colleen and I are in the, in the process of finalizing our last will and testament, and, and Colleen doesn't like talking about death when I bring that topic up. And and, you know, when, when I die, I say, if you want to, to survive on, on, on life insurance, like, you need to remember one password, just one password you have to remember. That gives you access to all of our bank accounts, to all of our life insurance plans, to all of our bills. You just need to remember one password. And she says, I don't want to know. Uh, we're not talking about death. We're not talking about death. Many of us don't like talking about death, but this is something that we all have in common, that, that we are all going to die, but we're really not going to die. We are all going to die, but we're not all really going to die. See, our physical bodies will cease to exist, but our souls, our spirits, that what makes us who we are as unique individuals made in the image of God, we will live on forever. So if you have your Bible this morning, pull it out, the second Corinthians. If you have your Bible, stick it up in the air. If you have your Bible here today, Oh, I see some charged Bibles this morning. I charged my Bible extra this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to be pulling a lot of scripture in this morning, and so I, I encourage you to follow along. I'm going to allow the word of God to do all the work this morning. So we're going to be bouncing all over the place. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 1. So the Apostle Paul, he starts off by saying this, for we know that if the tent that is our earthly home, he's talking about our, our bodies, he's using the tent as a metaphor to reference our physical bodies. If we know that our tent is, is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, it's eternal in the heavens. For in this tent, in this physical body, we groan, longing to put on that heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. He's saying that, that we're not just going to be these spirit beings wandering off into eternity. That there, there's going to be clothing for our spirits to come. And, and we're going to get into this, this physical resurrection of our bodies. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed so that what is mortal may be, I love this phrase, swallowed up by life. That Jesus came to give life and life more abundant, that we might be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the spirit as a guarantee. So 
We, always, we are always of good courage. Turn to the person on your left and say, I'm courageous. Say it one more time to the person on your left. I'm courageous. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage. Turn to the person on your right and say, I'm courageous. Doesn't sound very courageous out there this morning. And we would rather be away from the body and at home in the Lord. One translation says that absent from the body, present with the Lord. So, so with this all in mind, what is our goal? What is our purpose? You, we, what, why do we exist in these earthly bodies? I'm glad you asked. Paul goes on and answers that question. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to, to accumulate as much money as possible. We, we make it our aim to become YouTube famous. We make it our aim to get a record number of likes on our social media feed. We make it our aim not to have a dumb house with a picket fence, but a smart home with shiplap. <laughs> shiplap. Apparently that's a new deal. That's not what Paul says. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him, to give glory to God, to live for Christ. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. We must remember that whether here in this body or in heaven, when we have our resurrected bodies, our aim is to please Christ, to please Christ him to glorify him so let's pray as we enter into this this topic this morning father would you would you send your spirit to illuminate these words here this morning would you send your spirit to open our hearts and minds to what it is you want to speak to us today we need you to to do your work we ask these things in jesus name amen as you take your seat find five people give them a high five and say your life matters your life matters. Your life matters. I just want to take a moment and thank the worship team for leading us in worship this morning. Just ushering us into God's presence. He is already here, so we are just becoming aware of his presence here in this place, I just thank you for leading us this morning. As, as we talk about this idea of the resurrection and the body and the life everlasting, here, here's really a, a focus point, a, a, a main point. If you take notes, I want you to remember this. This is, what, this is what it's all about, that our belief about the afterlife impacts how we live this present life. Our belief about the afterlife impacts or ought to impact how we live this present present life or what we believe about eternity determines how we live today. See, if you believe that we're just an accident, then, then we're going to live a certain way with that belief. We're going to, just, to do things that, that, that we enjoy, that we're going to be self-centered. We're, we're going to just spend our 70, 80, 90 years, however long we have on this earth, and we're going to live life to the fullest, to, to, to what we want to do, when we want to do it, with whomever we want to do it with. If we believe our life is an accident, we're just going to go about and, and live our life the way we want to do it. But if we believe in everlasting life, in this resurrected life, then what we believe about that life is going to impact or ought to impact how we live today. This is actually one of our essential beliefs as a church, that we believe man exists somewhere forever, that we are eternal beings, that we will exist eternally either separated from God by sin in hell. This is a literal place, or we will be united with God by grace through faith in Jesus in heaven, that man exists somewhere forever. And so let me kind of take, tease this apart a little bit and, and just talk about death and, and what happens when we die. So the, the first thing that happens when we die is that, that our physical bodies are what actually dies. 
So listen to what the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 9. Verse 27, he says, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time. That everyone is going to die. It's in our destiny. It's in our future. And so then, then uh, the writer of Ecclesiastes, he puts it this way. So let's bring in some Old Testament context. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 2 and 3, it says, The same destiny ultimately awaits everyone, whether righteous or wicked, good or bad, ceremonial, clean or unclean, religious or irreligious. Good people receive the same treatment as sinners, and people who make promises to God are treated like people who don't. It seems so wrong that everyone under the sun suffers the same fate already twisted by evil. People choose their own mad course for they have no hope. There is nothing ahead but death. The verdict is in. Recent research has concluded that one out of one people die. You have a 100% chance of death. You are going to die. And, and as I've thought about this, I'm not so much afraid of death. I'm more afraid of how I'm going to die. Like, I am absolutely terrified of dying by a snake bite. That is, in my mind, the worst way to leave this earth. And, and so I'm actually researching this idea this week. And I know I, I, I don't have anything to do. I just preach on, on Sunday mornings for 30 minutes. That's the extent of my job. And so I'm, re, I'm researching all these different ways of how to die. And I've actually learned that, that my chances of dying by snake bite are, are slim to none. That I actually have a better chance of dying by a champagne cork hitting me in the head. Believe it or not. You have a two, one in 200 chance of dying by falling off the toilet. So while you're scrolling social media and leaning to the left, bam, you're dead. Like, as I think about, like, the worst way to die, dying by snake bite, that takes the cake. That, that we are nothing but dust. That we came from dust. We are going to return to dust. You are nothing but dust. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are nothing but dust. I, I was practicing this sermon uh, in the car with my son, and, and he said, Dad, did you just say I am butt dust? <laughs> no. That is not what I meant. I love it how nine-year-old boy and 35-year-old man think the same way. You are nothing but but thus, when, when, we, when we move on from this life, our physical bodies, we die. It's in the destiny of every human being. So first, that our physical bodies die. And then the second thing that happens is that our souls separate from our bodies. So Jesus actually says this in Matthew chapter 10. He says, and do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. He's saying don't fear people. Fear, live in a reverent fear of God who can destroy both body and soul. And then Paul says it this way in Philippians chapter 1, for, for to me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. If I am to live in this flesh, in this tent, in this physical body, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I, I cannot tell. I, I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart from this tent, depart from this body and be with Christ. For that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. You see, there is this separation of body and soul that occurs when you die. I, I, I would often try to comfort people when, when conducting funerals that for, for the person entering into heaven, eternity with the Lord, death is just like shedding of an old coat. That, that their final breath 
here on earth is immediately followed by their first breath in eternity with God. It's just the, the passage, taking off of an old coat and entering into a new life. Like that we are all going to die. And, and, and when you die one day and, and there is a, a funeral and everybody gets together at your Aunt Ebba's house later on and, and, and has a potluck dinner and everybody's clothed in, in black and mourning you, that, that that day you are going to live like you've never lived before. In going through our, our last will and testament, we're talking about funeral plans. And, and I told Colleen, I said, hey, if I die, you can do whatever you want. I'm going to be praising Jesus. I'm going to be dancing in the streets. So you don't have to worry about what, what I want in my funeral service. I'm not going to care. Because I'm going to live in that moment like I've never lived before. Now, what happens with our souls when our physical bodies die? And, and this is where we're not entirely sure as Christians. We, we have some, some insight in the scriptures, and so I'm going to try to unpack this a little bit. The, like, like Paul said, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Jesus actually said to the thief on the cross, if, if you remember that scene when, when, when there's two thieves on either side and and the one thief is sitting there mocking jesus and saying you are god like if since you are god why don't you take your angels and, and and deliver us from this place and and the other thief says do you not know who you're talking to and he says to jesus would you remember me this day and jesus responds to that criminal who who never did anything good with his life who never, who never was able to make amends for, for the wickedness and the evil that he had done, Jesus said to him, today you will be with me in paradise. And, and we don't know exactly what this place, paradise, is, but we, we know absent from the body, present with the Lord. And then Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I, I do not know. But God knows. And, and I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. But, but God knows. There is a, a mystery about what happens and where we are when we leave this earth and we're in the presence with God. Because there is a heaven, but then, then God is in the process right now of creating a new heaven and a new earth where we're going to be given these new bodies. And and so in, in between, we're a little murky other than we're in the presence of God. That, that is paradise. That is a heaven. And all we know is, is what Paul tells us, that it is far better to be with Jesus than in this present body. That our presence with God, that our, our physical bodies will die and our souls will separate from our physical bodies and we will be with Christ, that is far better. So for me to live is Christ and to, to die is gain. As a Christian, we, we don't have to fear death. That it's the shedding of a coat. Our last breath here on earth is our next breath with Jesus. It's far better. And then the third idea is this, that, that our souls will at some point, reunite with our resurrected bodies. If you want to take some time and, and study this, I would encourage you to dive into 1 Corinthians chapter 15. There's 58 some verses in that chapter, and so I'm not going to take us all through that passage today, but, but a good study of what the resurrection of our bodies will be like. You can, can tease that out in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I would suggest you have some commentaries alongside to help you navigate those and because there, there are all kinds of different views, and, and, and there's this mystery. We don't know exactly what it's going to be like, but, but Paul gives us an idea. And, and in the first century church, when, when they wrote this creed, when they came up with this apostles' creed, and they inserted this phrase, I believe, in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting, there were some key qualities that they believed about our resurrected bodies. If you are able to, just, just allow yourself to dream a little bit for the next few minutes. That our resurrected bodies, they will be immortal. They will be eternal. That it's not just our souls that live on forever, but our resurrected bodies will too live on forever. Now, I don't know if, 
if I want to live forever in this body? Like early on in, in my faith, when I thought about living on forever, everlasting in heaven, I'm like, oh, sounds kind of boring. Let, hear me out for a second, because in my mind, it's like, oh, we're, we're going to be singing to Jesus for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. We're going to be singing verses 1, 2, and 4 of your favorite hymn. We don't sing verse 3. I don't know what happens in verse 3. Everybody neglects verse 3, but we're going to be singing over and over the same hymn, and there's going to be these fat, chubby babies flying around with wings, and and, and I'm going to have to put on a robe. And, and even getting into heaven, it's going to be like this long line while St. Pete is checking off our names. And I'm like, this kind of sounds boring. We're going to be there forever. And, and my grandma's going to be there. And she's still going to be telling me that my pants are too tight, my hair is too long. It's like, I don't know about this place called heaven. It sounds kind of boring. But I can promise you that, that as we study the scriptures and we get little glimpses of what heaven will be at like it'll be anything but boring it will be completely mind-blowing that you're not just going to be sitting there playing a harp singing to jesus there's a couple of these qualities that that this early church believed about our resurrected bodies first one is, is impassibility it's this idea that we'll no longer be subject to pain or even inconvenience of any kind. So, so like when we step outside and we feel that bitter cold against our, our bodies, we're not going to feel that anymore. Or, or we're not going to feel that, that feeling of sunburn when you've been outside too long. And then you try to lay down at night and every time you move, it just, it's uncomfortable because it hurts that sunburn. Like we're not going to experience any type of, of that kind or of that pain that there's no force of nature that can hurt us. No sickness, no disease, this idea of impassibility. That there will actually be a brightness about us, another quality that the early church believed, that there will be some sort of a glorious glow around us. Again, if 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you, I'm, I'm unpacking some of these thoughts from that passage, that, that some will be like the sun, some will be like the moon, some will be like the stars, and it's not like one's shining brighter because he's better, it's just each is uniquely beautiful in their own right, that there's going to be some sort of, of glorious glow about us. A year ago, we went and invested in, in, in an amazing invention called Amazon Echo Plus. And what happens every time I, I yell out to Alexa, she lights up, kind of like Colleen does when I call her name, <laughs> just lights up. And, and Alexa, she, she hears me. She answers me. She lights up. There's going to be some sort of a lighting up, a glowing of our bodies, there's going to be agility, agility, that we're going to be free from any material burden, like, like the ability to move about with the greatest of ease. I, I can remember growing up as a young kid, I, I wanted to follow in my grandfather's footsteps. He was a, a World War II fighter pilot. He, he flew P-47 Thunderbolts, and, and as a young kid, I went to follow into his footsteps, and I wanted to be a Navy fighter pilot just like him until I learned that my eyes are really bad, and there's no way I could ever be a Navy fighter pilot. But when we get to heaven, when we have our resurrected bodies, we're going to have this ability to be agile, free from material burden, to, to be able to fly in any way that we'd like. At least that's my vision. That's my dream of heaven. Final quality that the early church believed in was this idea of subtility, that, that we will be completely controlled by our spirit. No longer controlled by our sinful flesh. That flesh that we wrestle with each and every day. That flesh that tells us we, we need this thing, but it's only going to be there to destroy us later on. We're, we're no longer going to be controlled by our, our bodies, but we're going to be controlled by our spirit. That our experience in heaven, in our resurrected bodies, will be far better than anything 
that we've ever experienced here on earth. That it's not going to be boring, it's going to be mind-blowing. Listen to what John says in, in his glimpse of heaven, Revelation chapter 21. He says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Husbands, do you remember that time when you were standing at the altar and, and you saw your bride for the first time round that corner in the back? And that feeling that you had when you saw your bride? That this is going to be just a glimpse of what heaven will be like. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning. Neither shall there be crying nor pain. For the former things have passed away, and, and he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. See, there's some sort of mystery that's going to occur that, that, that our bodies, they will be resurrected. And, and I don't know about you, but I, I'm not real crazy about this body I've got right now. Like for me, the year 34 in my life, that was, that was the year when I, when I started feeling things that weren't healing as quickly as they used to. That, that I have this nagging shoulder pain that continues to wake me up in the middle of the night. Like, like there's going to be no more of that with our resurrected bodies. There's going to be no more death, no more pain, no more sorrow. There's going to be no more fear. Can I pay that bill next month? There's going to be no more stress, anxiety, sleepless nights. There will be no more betrayal, no more abuse, no more divorce, no more abandonment, no more violence, injustice, racism, hate, no more po politics that, that nobody can get along. No more messed up shoulders. No more going to the bathroom in the middle of the night. No more bad breath. No more Mondays after vacation weekends. No more that time of the month. All the men and women said amen and amen and amen. No more of that. Heaven and our resurrected bodies will be the absence of everything evil and the presence of everything good. Heaven is going to be the absence of everything bad, everything wicked, in the, in the presence of everything glorious. I'm going to be singing like JT, dancing like Bruno, and soaring on wings like eagles like last year's Super Bowl champs, not this year's team. <laughs> Heaven is going to be far greater, far better than our wildest imaginations. If you can go to your mind and remember the most beautiful sunset you've ever seen. For me, it was on the coast of Phuket, Thailand, the most beautiful sight I have ever seen. Heaven's gonna be far better than that. That feeling of excitement when I saw Colleen at the, at the end of that aisle walking down that she had adorned herself for me, that feeling I experienced, heaven's going to be far greater than that. Sitting in the labor and delivery room when my three kids were delivered, experiencing the, the miracle of life right before my very eyes at heaven is going to be far better than that experience. Heaven is going to be the absence of everything evil and the presence of everything good. Paul says, for this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. 
that what we believe about the afterlife is going to impact how we live this present life. What we believe about eternity impacts how we live today for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen, they are eternal. I'm going to have the worship team come back up and join me as I close this out. Here's my hope for us today, specifically with this this sermon. That when we think about the idea of, of, of of resurrected bodies and and life everlasting, being eternally present with the Lord, that that I hope it does two things for us. Number one, I I hope it just relieves fear. That again, for the Christian, there, there ought not be any fear in death. And for some of us, that, that may be be more comforting than others. Some of, some of us have been through the ringer when it comes to the cards we've been dealt in life. And, and you're, you may be looking forward to that day. Some of us, we, we may have it pretty good. We, we've accomplished everything that we want to accomplish. And, and so for us to say, you know, that's going to be far better, there, there's a little bit of a doubt there. But this is going to be far beyond all comparison that that as we think about this as we allow our minds to wander and dream of what heaven will be like may it relieve some fear in us and may it cause us to take some greater risks that we don't just focus on the things that don't matter but instead we we focus on the things that are going to make an eternal impact that that when you're sitting on the floor with those snot-nosed, runny little kids across the way and and you're teaching them Jesus and helping them to meet Jesus and to know Jesus and and you see those kids later on in life, they they get baptized and they start living for Christ, their purpose and their aim and and they come back and they say, I remember my teacher back in Mission Kids, that that we're making an eternal impact, that we take some risks, that that we don't just focus on on the big nest egg that we can create for ourselves and and sending our kids off to college. Those are all good things. I'm not saying that we don't strive for those things, but, but are we focusing and taking risks on things that will have an eternal impact? And may that just relieve fear. The second thing I hope it does is that it increases our urgency. That it increases our urgency. Think about this. Each day, each moment, we are just that much closer to eternity. Out of these earthly bodies. Like now we are even closer. Now we are even, like now we are even that much closer to spending eternity with Christ, experiencing things that are beyond our wildest imaginations. And this is what gave the early church hope. It's what gave them confidence to to take on the burdens and the struggles of this movement that Jesus came to to start called the church and and the persecution that they underwent and endured. They had this living hope that that it was just going to be the shedding of a cope, taking one step followed by the other into the presence of their Lord and Savior. What we believe about the afterlife ought to impact how we live this present life. It should relieve fear. It ought to instill in us a sense of urgency. To be bold about our faith. That if we truly believe that Jesus died for our sins, that he created a way to have a relationship with the Father, and and whether or not we believe that is going to depend on where we end up like that ought to create some urgency with our family with our friends with those whom we love we are one day closer to that day and we are only ever getting one day closer to that day so may that create an urgency in each of us and every day to please Christ to live for him, to honor and glorify him 
to be the best father I can be, to be the best mother you can be, to be the best employer, employee, neighbor, friend. Would you stand to your feet with me? Just invite everyone to bow their heads, close their eyes, and see if maybe you can just have a moment with God this morning. I want to speak first to, to the one who you call yourself a follower of Jesus. You've placed your faith and trust in Jesus. And for those of you who have placed your faith and trust in Jesus, you know for sure that if you were to die today, you would be in eternity with Jesus, absent from the body, present with the Lord. I want to encourage you with these words Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the word of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Then Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, so whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. Maybe today's message was simply just to challenge you, encourage you to, to get back on the right path. Jesus says that wide is the path that leads to destruction, but narrow is the one that leads to life. And so maybe today it's just a, it's an opportunity for you to stick that stake in the ground and say, you know what, I haven't been living for you, God. I haven't been living for you, Christ. You haven't been my sole purpose and priority, and so I want to make you that today. If that's your prayer, will you just raise your hand for me so I can pray for you? You follower of Christ who have perhaps maybe wandered and, and want to just focus back in on him. I see you. I see you in the back. Your belief about the afterlife ought to impact how you live this present life. So Father, as as those who have indicated their desire to, to focus again on you, that they would keep their eyes on you, would you give them the power through your Holy Spirit to do just that? Would you challenge them, encourage them of the things that are important, and the decisions that they make, that they would make decisions that would have eternal impact for your honor and for your glory? As you continue, have your heads bowed. Perhaps you're here today and, and you haven't made that decision to follow Christ, to, to place your faith and trust in him for salvation. Perhaps one of the most familiar verses in the Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. You know, that thing that you've been trying to conquer on your own, that, that religion that you've been trying to earn your way back to God and it just continues to fail, that, that the Bible says it is by grace through faith that we are saved, that, that our sin was paid for once and for all on the cross. And that there's nothing that we can do to earn our way to God, to, to earn salvation other than placing our faith and trust in Jesus' finished work on the cross. Paul says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. The Bible says if you simply confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he was raised again, that you will be saved. If you want to make that decision today to follow Christ for the first time, I want to pray for you as well so that the decisions you make from this point forward have that eternal impact, that, that the way you live this present life is a reflection of, of what you believe about the afterlife. And, and so if that is you today and you want to make that decision, would you raise your hand so I can pray for you specifically? Amen. So Father, 
from this point forward, would you create an urgency within us that we would live our lives solely to bring you honor and glory, that we would aim to please you, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.